Hello there and you are welcome once again to the light of life. My name is Joseph Bimbo Akinjokun. We'll be continuing in the series, The Saints in the Psalms today and we'll be looking at Psalm 5. It's one of the Psalms of David. And today we're going to be looking at how much of a blessing God ordained that this Psalm should be unto us. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to look into your word again into the perfect law of liberty. Let the light of your word come to transform our hearts and illuminate our minds, causing us to know that which you have prepared for us in your word. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, Psalm 5 is also, like I told you, another psalm of David. And there are a lot of lessons that we can draw from this psalm. But we're going to be focusing majorly on verses 1 and 2, then verses 3 verses 7 8 and 12. i'm going to be drawing out certain lessons from it for us to learn that will help us in our spiritual walk now verse 1 and 2 this is david praying unto god he says listen to my cry O god consider my meditation give attention to my give attention to my request for you are my God and King. We've established in this series that prayer is a very important part of our Christian experience. But it is not just enough for us to want to pray. It is also very important that we know how to pray in order to get the kind of result that God wants us to get. When he says that we should call on him and he will answer and show us great and mighty things, that we know not. It is because he expects us to call on him the way we are supposed to. Prayer is a legal term and therefore it's not something that can be done anyhow. That's why you would see that when lawyers want to go to the court and pray the judge to grant a particular injunction, they don't just approach the judge anyhow. There are certain things that they would have to do, certain protocols that they will have to follow to enable them to get that request granted yes the judge is there the court system is set up for them they've gone to the law school and they are lawyers because they've already been called to bar but that does not mean that they now have access to the judge and just walk into the court room and say whatever it is that they want no there are certain protocols that they will need to follow if they want their prayer to be granted so we're going to be looking at some of these things today if you look at these first two verses what david is actually doing is drawing the attention of god onto himself prayer goes beyond you just staying in one place and mumbling certain things or shouting one of the most important parts of prayer is you being able to secure the attention of god And as you will see, as I will show you in scriptures, it is not everyone that prays that God gives attention to. For example, the Bible says that we know that God does not hear sinners. So he does not even pay attention to them in the first place, let alone hearing them. Because it's something that you pay attention to that you would hear. So, but this place, David is saying that it is very important for us to first and foremost secure the attention of God. That's why he's saying, listen to me, hear my cry, give attention to my voice, for you are my God and King. So don't just think that the fact that you opened your mouth and they say, okay, you're going to be praying for 30 minutes and then you pray throughout that 30 minutes. That means you have been able to get the attention of God. No, that's not how it works. There are certain things that you need to do for you to secure the attention of God. And David is telling us that this is a very crucial part of prayer. You don't want to, after spending 30 minutes, one hour, two hours in prayer, only to discover that God has not even heard you, let alone for him to even grant your request. You want to pray and in your prayer you want to be seen. You want to be heard. Blind Bartimaeus saw that Jesus Christ was passing by. He heard, of course, that the person that was passing was Jesus Christ, son of David. And then 
and began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus Christ didn't hear him at first. And the people were not telling him, keep quiet or don't disturb the master. The Bible says that the more they told him to keep quiet, the louder he shouted. Until Jesus Christ said, who is that? Okay, bring him to me. Jesus Christ stood still. Why? Because Bartimaeus was able to get the attention of Christ. Attention is key. The Syrophoenician woman that was following Jesus all around was saying, Oh my have mercy on my son. Jesus Christ did not even pay attention to her whatsoever. But she did not because of that give up. Jesus Christ even told her at some point, It is not meat for me to give the children's meat unto the dogs. The woman said, I know, but the, dro- the dogs even still eat the crumbs under the master's table. And that got the attention of Jesus. If he was backing him, sorry, backing her when he said that, that would most definitely make him turn around. So getting the attention of God in the place of prayer is very, very important. It is not something that we can do without or downplay. And how then can we get the attention of God? Like I said, the Bible says that God does not hear sinners. So the first and most important part on if you've been able to secure the attention of God is for you to live a righteous life. For you to walk in obedience to the dictates and the counsel and the law of God. There's no alternative to that. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9, it says the eyes of the Lord runs to and fro the earth, seeking for those whose heart are upright to show himself powerful and mighty on their behalf. Now, God is going across the world. The Bible says his eyes are running to and fro the earth. He is looking for not everybody, which means in spite of the fact that we are over 7 billion people on earth, God is still with his eyes roaming through the earth, looking out for select few, or let me say a particular kind of people. Those are the only ones that can get his attention. If you stand on the road and you are looking for someone, it is not everybody that passes by that gets your attention. You know what you are looking for, and it is only those who fits that particular description that you will look at. For example, you are, helping, you are waiting for somebody now and you are told that the person is driving a red car, maybe a red BMW, and it's, he's the only one in the car. The person is coming towards you. If you see a Honda or if you see a Chevrolet or you see a Toyota or you see a Mercedes-Benz, all of those ones would not matter to you. It is when you see a BMW, even when you see a BMW and it is black, what you were told that it's going to, it is red, every black BMW that passes you by would not even attract your attention. Because what you were told is that it has to be a red BMW with only one person in the driver's seat. Of course, only one person in the car and the person will be in the driver's seat. So you need to understand that righteousness is like that with God. People whose hearts are upright before him. Psalm 84 verse 11 says, The Lord is a son and a shield. He gives grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Which means, the ones that are able to secure his attention, enough for him to release what he has unto them, without any form of hesitation, without him holding back, are those who are upright in their hearts. So righteousness is key. And because we're talking about uprightness of heart, it goes beyond the things that you say. It goes beyond the actions that you display, the things that people see you do. It has to do a lot with what is in your heart. Because the Bible says that men look at the outward, but God considers that which is in the heart of a man. So when you're talking about prayer, If you want to secure the attention of God, the first and most important thing is that your heart must be right with God. And that is what righteousness really is. Righteousness is right 
thinking. It is right perspective of things. And that is what produces the right living, which is what we see on the outside. Praise the name of the Lord. The second way you can secure the attention of God is through praises. He says that he who glor- he says who offered praises or thanksgiving glorifies me. There's no way you'll be glorifying God by giving thanks unto him and praising him that you will not attract his attention. It is not possible. He says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise, which means at the beginning, what you should learn to do is praise God or worship him or give him thanks, showing appreciation for the things that he has done for you in times past. Jesus Christ, in teaching us the Lord's Prayer, began by saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That is worship. So that is one of the ways we secure the attention of God before we tend our requests before him. Before you present your petitions before him, you must first of all learn to secure the attention of God. And like I told you, the first thing you must learn is that you must have a right heart, an upright heart. Make sure that your heart is always right. Jesus Christ emphasized this when he said that if you come to the altar with your gift and you want to offer it and then you remember that your brother has something against you, he says, leave that thing at the altar and go back and sort things out with your brother. He also says that when you stand praying, forgive. All of these things have to do with the heart. So you cannot downplay the place of the heart when you want to pray. Praise the Lord. And the second thing is that you must have the attitude and the lifestyle of gratitude, of praises, of worship, and of thanksgiving to God whenever you approach him in the place of prayer. We see this clearly in what David is teaching us in verses 1 of and 2 of Psalm chapter 5. Then in Psalm 3, and so in verse 3, rather, he says something very, very interesting. He says that, Lord, he said he would present his requests before God in the morning, and then he will watch. He would present his request. Note, he had first of all secured the attention of God, saying, Lord, look at me. I'm the one crying out to you. First of all, getting sure that God is looking at him. And says he would present his requests before God in the morning and then he will watch. This emphasizes the need for us to pray in the morning. Morning prayers are not religious activities. It is a way in which you set the day, the tone for the day, the way you want it to be. When he said he would watch, it means when he presents his request before God, Lord, I want this today. He would not be at alert to see what God will do, what response God is going to give him during the day. To watch means you are standing at attention. You are preparing yourself. You are alert to see the response that God is going to give you. Because he understood that whenever he's able to secure the attention of God and he presents a request, he's guaranteed to get an answer, and therefore he begins to look out for the answer. That's what Jesus Christ was telling us in Matthew chapter 7 when he says, Ask and you will receive. He now follows the ask with, Seek, you will find. Seeking is like watching. You have asked by faith and you have received. When you now know that you have received, you now lift up your eyes and begin to look out for how God is going to answer that prayer. For example, let's say you wake up in the morning and you don't have food to eat. And you say, Lord, grant my request as in I don't have food to eat today. And provide for me. After, first of all, securing his attention, you say, Lord, provide for me. I don't have food to eat today. After you have said that, you now say, Amen. You now get up. You are now on the lookout to see whether an instruction will come to you on the next step to take, the place to go, who to visit, who will be coming to see you, and all of that. 
something that would order your steps or lead you into a place where you are able to realize the provision that God has made. That's so when he presents this request in the mornings, he knows, the Bible says that this is the confidence that we have when we ask anything according to his will, that he hears us. And because we know he hears us, we know we have that which we have requested of him. So he knew that he had prepared that in his day by asking what he wanted to see in the day. And then he begins to look out for those things to see how God would grant that request. This is a very important part of prayer. Watch, watch, watch. Don't just present your request before God and then keep a blank mind. When you ask him to do something for you, begin to stay on the lookout to see how he's going to do that thing for you so that you can take delivery of it. You can be in poor position to take delivery of that which God has said concerning you. In 2 Kings chapter 6, sorry, in 2, yeah, in 2 Kings chapter 6, there was a prophecy that within 24 hours, there was going to be plenty, abundance in the land. The people did not know how it was going to happen. Not knowing that God had already moved certain people who came, the Syrians that came with plenty of supplies into their camp when they laid siege against the land of Israel. When God was going to answer the prayer, he prompted the lepers to make a move towards the camp of the Syrians. And that was how God brought that answer to the prophecy that was declared. Those guys were watching. God put that thing in their spirit. They didn't even know what they were doing. But because they were sensitive, so to speak, to what was going to happen, they said, whether we die, if we stay here, we're going to die. If we make a move, we're going to... So let's just take the chance. What if they don't die? And it's right to move. And God used that to grant their request. So you must be watchful. When you say, Lord, do this for me, look out for how he's going to do it. If you read the book of 2 Samuel chapter 15 from verse 30 to 32, you will see that David prayed a prayer unto God. He said, Lord, defeat the counsel of Ahithophel, turn it into foolishness. And immediately finished that prayer. In the next verse, he lifted up his eyes and he saw Hushai the Archite. And instantly he knew that this was the person that God was going to use to answer his prayers. And what did he do? He told Ushai, go and submit yourself to Absalom so that when Ahitophel comes to give him counsel, you can defeat it for me. David prayed and he watched and then he was able to act because he saw the sign of what God did in request to the prayer that he called unto him concerning. So this is extremely important in the place of prayer. Every morning, present your request before him, and because you know he has heard you, go through the day very watchful, believing that what he has said to you, as what you have told him that you want him to do, and what he has given you concerning that thing, he's going to fulfill it, and then you are ready to take delivery of it. Praise the name of the Lord. Now, verse 7 also talks about something that is very important in the course of our worship. He said that he was going to approach the house of God, the place of the worship of God, with a lot of the abundance of the mercy and the loving kindness of God. And that in reverence or fear, he will worship God. This is one of the things that may be lacking in many of our churches today. People come to church rather than coming in the abundance of the mercy of God. A lot of people come with a lot of arrogance. People come for show off. People come to display skills, forgetting that the right approach to receive when you come into the house of God is for you to come in the abundance of his mercy. When you understand that you are not even worthy to approach him in the first place. So for you to worship in his presence, it is something you must see as an act of mercy from God. A privilege that is rare 
one you cannot in any way take for granted. So you approach him in his mercy and then you worship him with fear and trembling. Not that you come to church and then you begin to do all forms of manipulations or you come to church to quarrel or you are fighting your neighbor or you are cursing the pastor. No, you have come to worship God with the brethren and therefore you are expected to come with a lot of understanding of the fact that it is by mercy that you're able to approach him and then you worship him with a lot of reverence. The way we dress to church shows that we have Many of us don't have reverence for God. The way we talk, the way we conduct our affairs, the way we do service, many of us don't even have any form of reverence for God. Many of us do things without even thinking, forgetting that we are standing in the presence of God in the company of His saints. Hallelujah. We need to understand this. And keep it at the back of our mind. Let it be our lifestyle. That it is by mercy that we are approaching. And it is by fear and reverence that we are worshipping. That's why it says we should come boldly to the throne of grace. That we may obtain mercy. You come for mercy. And when you are coming to ask for mercy, to obtain mercy, you don't come with arrogance. You don't come with a sense of... um, I I am by far more important than everybody here. Remember the Bible that Jesus Christ gave concerning two people that came to pray. He said one of them came and was looking at the tax collector. The guy, a Pharisee, said, me, I fast twice a week. I pay my tithe. I give my offering. I don't do anything wrong. I keep all the laws and the commandments. He stood before God boasting when he's supposed to come and ask for mercy but he came in arrogance but the other guy said lord he said bible says he could not even as much as look up to heaven but with his head bowed down he said lord have mercy upon me and just christ said that that man left more blessed than the one that came in that arrogance so he had a lot of humility, looking out for the mercy of God, and then with a lot of fear and trembling. That was how he worshiped God. This is exactly what David was referring to here in this Psalm chapter 5, verse 7. And it's a lifestyle that we need to adopt. Praise the Lord. Now, verse 8. In verse 8, David said, Lead me in your righteousness because of my enemies we need the leading of god and we should know that god will always lead us in the path of righteousness we must also understand that this leading is crucial because there are many who want our downfall and by enemies i'm referring majorly to the devil bible tells us clearly who our enemy is it says in first Peter chapter 5 Verse be sober and be vigilant. For your adversary, the devil, goes about seeking whom he may devour. So he always goes around to seek our downfall. And the way we can escape him is for us to follow the leading of God. He says, lead me in your righteousness because of my enemies. So it's not just because of prosperity. Yes, I'm the Lord that teaches you to provide, that leads you in the way that you should go. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will guide you with my eye. It's not just because he wants us to make profit. It is also because he wants us to be safe from our enemies. Hallelujah. It's not just because he wants us to make profit. It's also because he wants us to be secure from our enemies. And that's why we must learn to follow the leading of God. The Bible says, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the children of God. Leading is paramount, is key. We must therefore learn to discern the voice of God, the promptings of the Holy Ghost, and He directs us so that we can come into a place of safety and security, away from where the enemy wants us to be. Praise 
the name of the Lord. And lastly, we're going to be looking at the last verse, which is verse 12, which is a very popular passage of scriptures. He says, Thou, O Lord, bless the righteous. With favor you surround him round about as with a shield. Now, if you read this verse in the King James Version, he says, Thou, O Lord, will bless the righteous. With favor you will compass him round about as with a shield. He puts will there as if it is something that is going to happen. But when you read other versions, like the English Standard Version, like the NIV, like if, as many other versions, you would see that it is the verses in them are consistent because they are talking about, excuse me, the fact that God has already done this. It is not that He is going to do this. It is Thou, O Lord, bless the righteous. With favor, you compass him round about as with a shield. So, as a righteous person, you are already favored of God. You are already favored of God. You are already blessed of Him. He says, Thou, O Lord, bless the righteous, which means it is God's lifestyle. It is something that He has done and He continues to do. Thou, O Lord, bless the righteous. The English language says, But you, Lord, bless the righteous. With favor, you surround him as with a shield. So, you are already favored of God. So, if you want favor, you ask for more of it. You don't approach God as if there is no favor in your life. If anybody tells you that there is no favor upon your life, tell the person that that is inconsistent with the truth. Speaking concerning Jesus in Luke chapter 2 verse 52, it says, he increased in wisdom, in stature, in favor with God and man. It is, it's not that God just gave him favor freshly. He increased in it. And like Christ, you are a child of God. And therefore, what you ask for is increase in favor. If you don't acknowledge what you already have, how can you receive an increase in it? Therefore, you must know that the favor of God is upon your life. Let it be something that you live with. Let it form the basis of your thinking that you are blessed and you are favored of God. You are not going to be blessed. You are not going to be favored. You are already blessed and favored. You just receive more of it. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. When he says that we will have life and have it more abundantly, it is because you already have that life. When he says God is able to make all grace abound towards you, it is because there is already grace at work in your life. What happens is there is increase in the measure that you have. Hallelujah. So you are already favored. You are already blessed by God. It is not that you are going to be blessed by God. These are the lessons that I want us to draw from Psalm chapter 5. And I want you to meditate upon it as you go on in the course of your walk with God. And it's my prayer that these words will produce abundant fruits and testimonies to the glory of the Lord in your life. Let us pray. Thank you, Father, for your word that we have received today. Thank you because our eyes have received, our eyes have behold wondrous things from your word and our ears have had wonderful sayings from your mouth. Let this word produce fruits, O God, in our lives, causing us to become strong and established in our faith, becoming more and more productive in our work with you. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Thank you very much for today. God bless you and join us in the next episode.